When you're talking about engines, if you hear terms like double overhead cam or multiple spark plugs per cylinder, often you might think of a very modern engine. In fact, it took General Motors until 1987 to produce its first double overhead cam engine, the Quad 4 four-cylinder that was engineered by Oldsmobile. Ford actually had produced a double overhead cam V8 in off-road applications in World War II, actually starting in 1940, called the GAA V8. And it was an all-aluminum double overhead cam, 1,100 cubic inch, flat plane crank design that was used in Sherman tanks and other applications during World War II. And I said that right. All aluminum, double overhead cam, flat plane crank, 1,100 cubic inch, also 60 degree V8 in 1940. We also have a video on that particular engine, so check out the videos on my channel. But in general, double overhead cam engines really didn't come into vogue until the 80s or 90s. And there were other producers in automotive applications of double overhead cam engines relatively early on. These included Duesenberg that started producing double overhead cam straight eight engines in 1928. Before that, Duesenberg did produce single overhead cam engines, but their double overhead cam engines were introduced in the 1928 model year. And I think most every automotive historian would say that Duesenberg engines were some of, if not the most advanced in the world when they were produced. And that was certainly true. They had double overhead cam engines. They had supercharged engines. They were really ahead of their time, again, in the late 1920s. But in doing research on advanced gasoline engines, I came across a company that was a niche builder of mostly marine engines. And its name was the Sterling Engine Company of Buffalo, New York. Sterling Engine Company was originally located on Niagara Street, more specifically 1246 Niagara Street in Buffalo, but by 1925 it had expanded its operations to include an area on Mason Street as well and a second factory building on 42 Breckenridge Street. It appears they originally began focusing on marine engines and produced all different types of configurations, gas, diesel, four, six, eight cylinders, I haven't found any V-configured engines that Sterling produced. It appears they were always inline engines. Again, from what I can discern, it's a little hard to find information about them. But by 1946, it appears that they had expanded to a number of locations, including having offices in New York City, Washington, D.C., and Chicago. They began producing marine engines around 1907-1908, but by the mid-1940s, they were not only producing marine engines, but also engines for cars, trains, airplanes, and other ships, including engines that powered the 83-foot landing craft in World War II. In the late 1950s, Sterling was purchased by Phillips Petroleum of Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and they moved their production facilities from Buffalo, New York, to Paola, Kansas, and that was kind of the end of Sterling Engine, at least in Buffalo, New York. And I can't really find too much about them after that period of time. But we're going to talk about the Sterling Coast Guard engine because it was a truly revolutionary engine for the time and one that I don't think a lot of historians have frankly heard of. Here's a brochure for the Sterling Coast Guard engines and it's dated 1927. But Sterling had been making these engines for a few years prior to that, around 1924, 1925, as best as I can discern. And that is several years before Duesenberg would come out with its double overhead cam, straight eight cylinder engine in 1928. But take a look at this particular specification sheet within that brochure and notice the different features that it mentions for this engine. The first is it says twin carburetors with safety backfire devices. Well, twin carburetors, not overly exotic, but you know, two carburetors as opposed to one was a little bit challenging. But if you notice something that says dual valves overhead camshaft, this engine had double overhead cams underneath that valve cover, something, again, that was extremely rare for the time. You'll also notice it says removable cylinder walls for replacement. So it had cylinder liners that you could take out and replace and effectively rebuild the engine quite easily. All spiral bevel gears for quietness. I, I'm shocked that they would care so much 
about refinement in a Coast Guard engine, but apparently they did, and they say even including reverse gear. So they're proud to denote that they're using quiet gearing in a Coast Guard engine, and not just in forward gears, but also in reverse. You also notice it says complete enclosure, oil tight and vaporless. And the engine, as you notice in this picture of a real Sterling Coast Guard engine, there's really not much that's left exposed outside of things that are enclosed. They put everything under some form of an enclosure, which I would say was a smart thing for the time. And also notice it says four ignition systems, four spark plugs per cylinder. So not one, not two, not three, four spark plugs per cylinder. What a monster. This engine displaced about 456 cubic inches. You'll note here on this last page, it says six cylinder, six and a quarter inch bore, seven and three quarter inch stroke. So if you do the math, that comes out to 456 cubic inches. But it's definitely even more of a monster, I would say, in terms of its size and weight beyond you know, this 456 inch displacement. Apparently, there were different speed ranges that you could purchase this engine in. Notice here at the bottom, it says there's three speed ranges, 600 to 900 RPM, which made 100 to 150 horsepower, 900 to 1200 RPM, making 150 to 225 horsepower, and 1200 to 1500 RPM, making 230 to 300 horsepower. 300 horsepower back then is a lot of horsepower from 456 cubic inches. So quite impressive. And this was not an engine, obviously, that was designed to be operating in the high RPM ranges. It just happened to make a lot of horsepower, and it did it at relatively low RPM. So quite an amazing engine. And apparently, like I said, it proved quite popular with some of the vessels that the Coast Guard was using. And you can see in the brochure that they list some of them and show pictures of them in the brochure, as you see here. Apparently, they were quite proud of what they produced. And Makes sense to me that they would be proud of what they produced. It was certainly a revolutionary product for the time. And I guess it was known to be a reliable engine overall. And after a bit more research, I came across this undated brochure from Sterling that talks about the history of the company. And you can see here, they talk about the Sterling Engine Company after several years of experience was incorporated in 1902. Its president has continued to be C.A. Creaky. I guess is how you pronounce his name, who became an interested as a yachtsman and whose sole object was to produce a better and more reliable marine engine. On this next page from the same brochure, they tout a number of inventions. They say that the counterbalance crankshaft used in high-powered engines appeared originally in Stirling's, and more recently, Stirling was either the first or among the initiators of oil coolers and filters, renewable cylinder liners, double overhead cam engines, and many other details, as they say, which typify various models. They were also the first to have attained a mile per minute on the water, in fact, a rate of 66 miles per hour, or so the company claims. But obviously, it was a very advanced company that did a lot of interesting things in very early years. I do find some other elements of this brochure interesting. They talk about their offices and they say, offices are well lighted. Desk chairs and furniture are modern and well kept, stimulating pride and willingness while a spirit of cooperation is predominant. And they also note efficiency in administration is determined by the relation of the volume of business to the number of executives and clerks. By efficient systems and loyalty, conscientious employees keep this part of the business in proportion which helps to market a quality engine at a reasonable price. So they're basically touting that they have a relatively thin management structure that affords them an ability to produce great engines at relatively low prices. You don't really hear too many companies uh, talking about that nowadays, but, well, I guess it made sense. They also tout in here that they test their engines. You can see here these tests at the approximate installation angle consume 35 to 40 running hours, and they're run on light loads originally that are gradually increased until the final two hours of the test where they're tested at full speed. And you can see a couple of these Coast Guard engines, as they say, just completing their 48-hour run in the test room there below. And finally, here's a picture of their plant. 
Uh, on 1270 Niagara Street in Buffalo, New York, the plant is still standing, although obviously the Sterling Engine Company is long since gone. In any case, I thought that you would enjoy this spotlight on what is apparently an extremely advanced company founded by an individual who took a significant amount of pride in his workmanship and the company's workmanship. And frankly, there's great reason to. They produced a lot of interesting engines. Apparently, whatever year this brochure was produced, Sterling had sold about 450 to 500 engines to the U.S. government in that year alone. And I'm guessing that was at a pretty hefty price. So that was worth touting. But a great company making great engines. Let's close out with a video of one of these Sterling Coast Guard engines running so you can just hear what they sounded like. Thanks again for watching.